Um, by way of an overview, we've read there the global flood in Genesis chapter 6, and we believe the scriptures to be true, and that is a, an account of what God has done in the past. And we're going to use the scriptures because that's what we believe to be true. The Bible, from beginning to end, all scripture, as Paul said to Timothy, is given by the inspiration of God. So wherever we go in the scriptures, we should find harmony. And we're going to show that with a few uh, scriptures this afternoon. Um, the story of Noah's flood has been believed for centuries, yea, even millennia, by Bible-believing readers. But yet in relatively recent times, many Christians have turned their backs on parts of the scripture, particularly Genesis, and particularly the Noah flood. Why have they done that? And that's what we're going to look at this afternoon. Why have they done that? And are the reasons that they've done it, are they reasonable, are they valid? Well, the scriptures did forecast that there will be scoffers in the last days, that the Bible will be held in, in low esteem, and that many would turn from the truth before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at a few sections on that, particularly found in Second Peter. Then what evidence is there for a global flood? Well, we've read parts of scripture there. We'll look, some, look at other parts of the scriptures to, to demonstrate that the flood was in fact global and not a local flood, as, uh, as many of the... Uh, the critics of the Bible believe. Because the flood was global, we should expect to find in the earth, in the rocks, in the strata around us, we should expect to find evidence of that. If we can find that, and we can type the scriptures, then there is, then there is a reasonable ground for believing that the scripture is true, if you are a non-believer at all. I think the evidence we're going to show tonight, uh, this afternoon rather, is interesting, if not compelling to you. But at the end of all that, the Bible message is, is that God's kingdom will be upon the earth. Those that have tried to follow God's ways will be saved. And they're going to be saved by water. And the story of Noah runs right the way through the scriptures. And it's a fundamental belief of the gospel message. We get rid of the gospel message through Noah, then we have not a lot left in the scriptures. Which we don't believe that to be true. The, the Bible is true, we believe. So with that overview, we're just going to... Have a look at a few scriptures then. We were there, didn't we, in our reading that Sam gave us. I just want to pick out a few of the verses, the key verses. Why did God destroy the earth with a flood? Because it says then in uh, verse 5, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent, the thought of his heart, was only evil continually. Such was the depravity of mankind at that time. It's believed at that time that there wasn't just hundreds of people on the earth, not thousands or hundreds of thousands. In fact, it's estimated there was over a billion people upon the earth at this time so we're not talking about a few people we're talking about a large population on the earth and the majority as far as god was concerned had moved from the truth moved away from that and were doing their own their own aspirations their own thing because of that it grieved god he said i'm going to destroy them from the face of the earth but notice it just wasn't mankind it was man beast creeping thing and birds of the air everything was going to be destroyed and that would necessitate a global flood because of that, verse 14 there, Noah was given the command to go away and build an ark. Now it's said in the scriptures there that, that the age, the, the period of time of man would be 120 years. Now whether that was the time that God built the, uh, told Noah to build the ark or not, it's, it's not particularly clear. That would be the maximum time that God would have given Noah to build the ark. It could have been less than that. Nonetheless, it was a, a relatively uh, large period of time to build this large vessel. And the reason was, God was going to destroy the earth with a flood. So Noah was going to be in a vessel that would save him on the water. So the timeline. We believe these things occurred approximately 2,350 years BC, the time of Noah. And we get from the scriptures, we get a, a chronology or a timeline that's related to the age of Noah. And when we go through, we can pick up periods of time that the flood was upon the earth. So we read there, the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, and the seventh day of the month, that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So what we think was happening at that time, as we know from our jolly lessons at school, that the, the earth's crust, the layers are very fluid. The, uh, the plates, tectonic plates they're called, they can move very dramatically. We have earthworks coming up. So what we think happened at that time was that the great basins of the earth were raised up the plates would move, force up, and of course the waters that are on there would naturally come up as well. So the, the, the earth would come up, 
beneath the waters, it would push the waters up and naturally water find its own level. So that would push up, as well as the water coming down from heaven, but the vast majority of the water that was flooding the earth was from the movement of the sea basins coming up and flooding the earth. And that would have caused devastations. We know the Sunday school stories where we see a jolly ark floating on the water, but this time it would have been absolutely devastating. The water would cover everything. The forests uprooted, everything turned over, the sea creature, everything over the earth. It would have been a horrific sight for those that were left, and particularly Noah and his family that were left on the boat observing these things. But we see, where did this water go to? Which says, this is the, uh, the New King James Version, by the way. I've, I've been reading from the King James Version. This is the New King James Version. It says, the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits. So God's given us a, quite a definite uh, description here. Didn't just cover the earth. He's telling us 15 cubits, 22 and a half feet above the, the tops of the highest mountains. And of course, we don't know in these days how high the mountains were because there's been significant changes with the earth um, geology. But nonetheless, the highest mountain was covered. As we say, water found its own level, so the whole area would have been covered. The mountains were covered. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. That's more than enough time for the sediments that were brought up to be deposited on the earth to solidify. Scientists have proved this in the laboratories that it doesn't take long for rocks to solidify. It can happen by a chemical process, it happens by pressure, it doesn't take an awful long time. And 150 days is more than enough time for these waters uh, to deposit their sediments and to settle upon the face of the earth around the world. Then we see that the waters then gradually decreased until the point where the mountains could be seen. And then it says on the second month, on the 27th day of the month, this was in the second year of Noah, the 601st year of Noah rather, that the waters dried down. So what we see in there was the earth came up, deluged the whole earth, the, the sea basins came down again, and obviously water found its own level, and again the earth was, was scoured by the waters going back into the, back into the seas. So it was a twofold um, devastation really, the first arising and the second as it de uh, declined into the earth. And from the scripture we work out, that's approximately 370 days from the start to the finish. Over a whole year, the earth was covered. If you turn to Second Peter, this story that we've read there, a true story we might add, was not going to be believed. For God gave a forecast, gave a prophecy, if you like, that before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to set up his kingdom, there will be those that would dispute the record that we've read there. And Peter, writing to, his, to the believers, he writes them in verse 3 there, Knowing this, that there shall come, in the last days before Christ returns, scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed from creation. Yet we just read in the Genesis accounts, over 1600 years after the creation that there was a massive devastation upon the earth and he goes Peter says well for this they're clearly they're willingly ignorant they've read the scriptures they knew the account they're willingly ignorant of this thing that as God created the earth to start with on day two of creation he created the heavens and on day three it says the earth was formed water the earth came out of the water and he says by the same action by the same power God brought the flood upon the earth. And he said the whole world was overflowed and perished. That same power, he says, is going to be at the control of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back to the earth to, to, to judge the earth, but not with the flood as we shall see. So what the scripture clearly telling is that there were going to be those that wouldn't believe the Genesis account. They're willingly ignorant that the world was overflowed by a flood, as God had said. We just want to spend a little bit of time just looking at what we believe these scoffers were. These three gentlemen there, we'll discover in a minute their background. But the geologists have come up with a plan to discredit the scriptures. We see there in the late 18th and 19th century, the geologists argued that actually the rock layers that we see there, the sedimentary layers, 
took millions of billions of years to form. It was a slow, gradual process till we get the strata that we see on the earth today. And because of that, many Christians, Christian pastors, theologians around the world have actually disputed the geological count that we find in Genesis chapter 6. They would rather side with these scientists saying actually no flood didn't occur. Everything we see around us from a geological point of view has took millions of years. Now why would they do that? Well I think it's to do not through geology but rather philosophy. The first gentleman there, John Hutton, if we can see there, he was a geologist and he was a founder of the uniformitarian principle. In other words, everything we see today has always been the same going back through time. That was surprising. That's exactly what the scripture said, didn't it? That everything continues as they were from the beginning of creation. But his principle was that the past history of our globe must be explained, he says, by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. So clearly from that, miracles cannot be part of this, of this, uh, this principle. He says, everything must be explained by what we can see. And yet what we see in the scriptures, God's in control, it's through God's miraculous powers. And by one sweep of the pen, this geologist is saying is, we're not going to accept miracles. Everything we see today is our understanding of how we see the past. And he says that no action is to be admitted. Now, that's not very good science. If there's evidence to prove one way or another, you will look at all the evidence. But in one fell swoop, swoop, this geologist has said, we can ignore the Bible because we don't believe in miracles. And the second chap we want to look at, a chap called Charles Lyle, following on in, in the same vein as, uh, as Hutton, in writing a letter, he says, I'm sure you may get into the quarterly review, which was an imminent um, um, natural history magazine at the time. And the purpose of him writing his article, Charles Lyle, was that we will free science from Moses. Now Moses, the Bible tells us, wrote the first, recorded the first four books of the Bible. So it's clearly an attack on the Bible. We're going to show that science, as he would call it, would disprove Moses and the, and the, and the record. And we note there that he was a friend of, uh, of Charles Darwin. And his, the geological teachings of these two, Hutton and Lyle, allowed Charles Darwin to develop his theory that of evolution over millions and millions of years from molecules to, to mankind, as we say today. So we make the point that their viewpoints are not really scientific, they're more philosophical to get rid of the scriptures. But the sad part is, is that many Christians have taken up this viewpoint and said, well, science must be true. And therefore, how do you reconcile long ages with, with the Bible? So we have the, the theory of theistic evolution that seeks to manage the, the conflict between the scriptures and what science is teaching. But how then do you account for the flood. If the flood put all the sediments down upon the earth over a rapid period of time, 370 days, then how do you reconcile that with, with, with the teaching of evolution? As a Christian, how do you manage the two? Well, by doing that, we say, well, actually, it wasn't a global flood, it was a local flood. And yes, there was a catastrophe, as God had said, but it was only local. It was only a localised area, and therefore the rest of the strike we see across the earth can be explained by these long periods of time. So that basically is, is the case that we're looking at this afternoon. So how would we answer that then? Well, if we, let's just say the biblical viewpoint. just want to bring up a few passages and a few observations just from the scripture itself. We read earlier, didn't we, in chapter 6. And in chapter 7, we get more detail. It says that the water prevailed more upon the earth, so all the high mountains were covered up under the heavens. And 15 cubits, a reiteration. Now, clearly, a local flood would not reach above the mountains. A local flood would only be a localised area. Water finds its own level. If the water goes above all the mountains, then all the earth will clearly be covered. Just as it was in the beginning when God created the earth. On Genesis chapter 1, we find that all the earth was covered in water. God has, re, if you like, revisited what he did in the beginning. That all the mountains were covered. What about the aspect of gathering together all the birds and the cattle and the beasts and everything? That everything that had breath should die. We said that it's, it's all the birds and the cattle. So 
if we set up with a local flood, how would you get all the birds flying in the air to come into one place? If the flood was local, those birds would fly to other parts of the earth and survive. But God was quite clear in what he's saying is that flesh, birds, cattle, creeping things, all mankind, everything that had life, was died off the face of the earth. Clearly consistent with a complete flood across the earth. And don't forget, we're trying to explain to a Christian that is disputing these things. So we, we, would, we would challenge that by looking at the scriptures. What does the scripture tell us? So it continues. Thus he brought down every living thing that was upon the face of the earth. And in case we didn't get the, the message, only Noah and the animals that he brought into the ark were left. So the scripture, I think, is quite clear. The water was there. Noah was in the ark. He was above all the mountains. Why was it 15 cubits? Well, it's a rather large ark with a lot of animals in it. You'd need some clearance so the ark wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't foul up on the mountains. I think God's talking about all these practical things. Everything's under his control. But why build such a big ark if it was only going to be a local flood? You don't need a small boat to, to rise above the water level in the region that you're living. Why go to the extent of building such a big ark and put all the animals in if you're only going to be a local flood. And why would you take over 100 years to build it? Why wouldn't you just walk or go to another part of the earth where the flood wasn't going to be if it was a local flood? It doesn't make any sense, does it? God's given these commandments to Noah because it was going to be a complete flood upon the earth. And why take all the animals? I'm sure the hunts of the, the can tell us here. If you're looking after a farm, the animals, it takes an awful lot to keep an animal. Why would you go to the bother of putting all these animals in all these three decks and all these particular places on the ark if it's going to be a local flood? No, this ark was built to be saved, to, be, to save the occupants of all the animals, all the birds, and the creeping things that were on the ark. We said there, approximately 370 years. This is not a local flood, is it? This is a long period of time designed to destroy all living things. But there's another aspect that actually challenges God even further. Because God said after this, he would not destroy the earth with a flood. He gives the rainbow in the, earth, in the earth, in the sky, when rain comes down, as a confirmation of the covenant, an everlasting covenant, that he would not destroy the earth with a flood. Now if we think only part of the earth was flooded, a local flood, then we experience floods upon the earth, don't we? We've seen this week, haven't we? There's floods around the earth. In, in, in Great Britain, there are floods. So if you believe in a local flood, and God said he wouldn't destroy the earth with a flood, we shouldn't expect to see any local floods either. Now, that's a ridiculous statement, isn't it? Because we do see them. So if this couldn't be a local flood that, that God's talking about, it had to be a global flood. Because we see localised flooding now. And indeed, I think if we read the scriptures as they as they present themselves, we'll see that's what happens. And we say that God cannot lie. So it must have been a, local, uh, a global flood, not a local flood, because we see local floods happening today. That's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Many Christians just believe in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. Well, even Jesus, didn't he? He, he said when he comes back to the earth, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of, the son of Man returning to the earth. They drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark. Jesus clearly believed in the Old Testament scriptures. When he comes back, it will be judgment, just as it was in the days of Noah. It won't be with a flood this time. God promised he wouldn't destroy the earth with a flood. But it will be, it will be um, subject to destruction and judgment in many parts of the earth. But the point to note there is the flood came and destroyed them all, all mankind. We've read from Peter. What did he say? He confirms the, the uh, Genesis account that God did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, one, eight, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So again, we're getting consistent teaching from the Old Testament through to the New Testament through Jesus Christ and his apostles. So that's a brief run through some of the, just the logical interpretation of scripture as we read it. But we said earlier, we'd expect to find other information from the earth and from, from the, uh, 
from the historical records that we see around us that would lead us back to um, a flood. What we do find is that all parts of the earth, there's flood legends, many parts of the earth, the Middle East, throughout Europe, Australian Aborigines, they've got their own legends, Egypt, Peru, Scandinavia, all these have accounts of a global flood. If it's not a worldwide flood, then why would we find so many records of them? So it's not just one account, it's all those people from Noah's time have gone throughout the world and that message, that knowledge has been passed on through generation as they've filled the earth after Noah's time. And they've all taken the same message, not in one part, not a local area, but all parts of the globe. Many of you have probably seen this, this chart here, which purports to show the ages of the earth and the, the animals that are found at the bottom going upwards from the Cambrian period, the period that geologists have identified, and going through we'd see from small mollusks and little creatures, gradually developing over a period of time to get into fully formed large creatures and mankind. And the scale is going from millions of years all the way through. And we've got neat layers there that geologists have, have, have claimed that that is how we find the fossils in the earth. But that's not actually true. What they've actually done is they've taken fossils from different parts of the earth and assumed because it fits their idea of evolution, it's assumed that we're going from the lesser to the greater over a long period of time. But when you look at, at the writings and, and various uh, of journals, you find that actually it is an interpretation of the past. Obviously these scientists weren't there, we can't recreate the past, so they're looking at the evidence from the past. And they're interpreting, along with Lyle and Hutton earlier, to suit their own viewpoint. Unfortunately, as we've seen in the past 300 years, that their viewpoint has gained the upper hand. And so these things are taught in school as open as fact. When we actually look at how these things came about, it is very dubious that they are indeed facts at all. Many assumptions are made. We would expect to see in that chart, if there's an evolution from small uh, microorganisms and small animals, creatures, going through to fully formed complex animals, we'd expect to find in the fossil record some transitional forms between the one, you know, going from half a bird half a dinosaur to a fully fledged man, etc. one. Do we find that in the historical record written in the earth? No, we don't. The book written here by uh, Colin Patterson of the British uh, Museum of Natural History, he was uh, writing back to um, a correspondent after he published this book. And he writes these words which are interesting. He said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of the evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. So even here is a, a respected paleontologist. He's studying the, the fossil record. He says, we cannot find any intermediate forms going from simple creatures to complex creatures. So there's no evidence there. So why believe it? Because it's not about geology or about science, it's about philosophy. And are, are these layers exactly as we find in, in, uh, in the world? Well, well no an article in the Nature magazine. They've discovered that some of these um, creatures in the Cambrian here, here have been found higher up, and yet this is supposed to be a progression of time when things evolve from simple to complex. Yet these creatures have been found in different layers. As the scientist said, they're in the wrong layer. Is that a scientific approach to this? No. I don't believe it is. I don't believe it is. Because what we'd expect to find from Noah's flood is that everything, the turbulence that occurred, everything would be found, not in any particular order, as the science have, have neatly done there, you would expect to find different creatures, different animals. You would expect to find seagoing creatures on the tops and above the mountains, which are totally out of order, aren't they? But when the flood came up and then it came back down again, everything was deposited, you would find these things on the tops of mountains, and you are finding deep sea creatures, fossilised, on the tops of mountains. I think the evidence is, is quite clear that this is an interesting interpretation of what's, what's in the earth, but not, but not a true fact. So what do we do find then? We've just got a few slides. And this one here is showing, if you can see that. This is a fossilized remains of a, of a tree. You can see the trunk going there. It's going through many different layers. Now these layers are supposedly been deposited over millions of years. Well, clearly, if a tree was going to be deposited in the first layer over millions of years, we all know what happens to vegetation if it's left after a period of time. It breaks down. 
it crumbles, it corrupts, and it, and it goes away as dust. By definition, fossils, when they're fossilizing anything, must happen rapidly. Because we see all around us, when we see a bird in the garden fall down, two days later, it's gone, isn't it? Insects have come, taken it away. Birds have come, cats have eaten it. Everything that God designed is designed to be cleaned. Nothing lasts for more than a few days or a few hours in some instances. So nothing can last in a period of millions of years without decaying and falling apart. So it's not possible that these trees that are found in these layers can be explained by millions of years. It's more consistent with a rapid flood. Because when that, earth, that water was risen above the earth, all the forests would have been taken away and all that turbulation and going through the settlement down the settlements, we'd find the trees would be through many layers of sediment. That's exactly what we find in the earth. Consistent with Bible teaching. If it was a global flood, we would expect to find similar stratas across all the earth. What do we find? Well, the White Cliffs of Dover, chalk, as you can see on the screen there, it's consistent right the way through the globe. Europe, Middle East, round the way through to Egypt, Israel, everywhere. We see the same strata level with the same fossils in, so we know from the same, the same, from the same era, the same period of time. You wouldn't get that if it was a local flood. You just get local sediments. What we actually find is across the whole earth, we get consistent sediments. Again, that is consistent, isn't it, with a local flood. You probably can't see too well on the screen here, but this is a picture of the Grand Canyon. And you can see there's very dis discrete levels there in the layers of the strata there. Now, if this first layer, for example, was, was laid down and it was million years before the next layers were putting on, we would see the normal process of, of, uh, of, of weathering, of rivers going through, freeze thaw action. We would see, actually, that these layers would be inundated with valleys, with troughs, with things burying into them. But the record doesn't show that. When you slice through these rock layers, it is sharp levels. There is no weathering or any erosion between there. So what's that telling us? That these levels were put down very quickly. If there were long periods of time, then you would see valleys and troughs in them, but you don't see that. Again, evidence of a rapid deposition of these flood layers, as we see in the scriptures. This one's an interesting one. Rocks are actually folded and at quite obtuse angles here. Now, rock, as we know, when it hardens, it is very brittle, and if you move it, it, it snaps. But these, these strutters here are actually bent. So they have to be quite pliable. They have to be quite plastic to, to allow that. And again, it's consistent with the flood. The sediment's being put down. As the waters are, are moving backwards, and the whole earth is, again, it's under volcanic reaction, we can see how the earth's moving. Now, these rocks would have to be plastic to actually be bent and move around. And exactly what they are. We keep, they're quite smooth layers going round. Again, it's evidence of, a, of a, a rapid flood. So that's just a few. There are many other examples we, that, we, that we could mention, but that's just a few. But the implication, if it wasn't a worldwide flood, as some Christians teach and believe, if it wasn't a worldwide flood, then God can't be believed, because I think we've seen from the scriptures himself, God destroyed all the earth with a flood. So there's a conflict now. If you want to be saved, as the Bible teaches, saved from, from the wrath to come of God, as it's spoken of, then you need to believe the gospel. And the gospel is based upon the Old Testament writings as well. Because Peter writes here, he says, For Christ also suffered for the sins, once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to, to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the one spirit. That's the gospel hope. It's gone to everybody that there can be a hope for the future. But he links it, he says, who formerly, these people in the past that didn't heed the word of God, they were destroyed by the flood, he said they were disobedient, but Noah and his family, they were saved. He said, so the divine long sufferance of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. All that time he was building the ark, Noah was preaching the gospel. Judgment's coming. If you want to be saved, you've got to get in this ark. And the Apostle Peter then is building up on the same point, he says, verse 21 there. There is also now an antitype, a similar type, what's gone before. Baptism. Eight souls were saved through water from the judgment of God. When, when Christ returns to the earth to, to judge the earth, 
Who will be saved? Those are in Christ. Just like those were in the ark, Christ is a type of an ark. So therefore, it is only through baptism that we can be saved. And that's what Jesus taught, didn't he? He said, well, when he comes back, they were drinking, etc. And God destroyed them. But the way to be saved, he says to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So that's the challenge of the Bible. Believe what God said. Believe what God did when he destroyed the earth with the flood. Clearly he did it for a reason. He could have chosen many things to destroy the earth. He could have caused a fire. He could have caused a famine. He could have caused plagues. But he chose to choose water. Because that was going to be the type of baptism. Baptism is important. It's part of the gospel message. Believe and be baptised. When Jesus was debating around him, he said, look, you know the scriptures, and the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus fundamentally believes in the scripture because they come from God. Now the challenge for our days is, is if the scripture cannot be broken, then we can't just to choose to believe part of it. We either choose to believe all of it or none of it. So those that choose to believe in theistic evolution, there is a real challenge. You can't pick and choose parts of the Bible. You believe all the Bible is it is there or not. Because if you don't, then salvation is in jeopardy. But God's given us all free will. The choice is ours. We can read the scriptures. We can look at the evidence. Certainly look at science. But look at scientists that are believing at least in the scriptures. Because you might have a reasoned viewpoint. If we follow scientists that want to get rid of the scriptures then it's no surprise that those scientists will produce evidence that will discredit the Bible. So we have free will to read the Bible and look at history around us and make, make our own choice. But Jesus Christ is returning to the earth and I'm sure we all want to be in the kingdom at that time. And if so, we need to be saved by water. Thank you.